we are so privileged to be joined by contemporary artists um, Vensa Christ and Michael Najjar, um, whose projects explore and critique the idea of Mars as a possible planet B. And we will also be hearing from speakers from leading space agencies in Asia, JAXA's Dr. Masaki Fujimoto, space faculty Lynette Han, and A-star scientist Dr. Roy Ang, whose work articulates space technology's transformative potential. Our first speaker for the second part of the program is Dr. Fujimoto, and he's the Deputy Director General of the Institute of Space and Astronaut Astronautical Sciences um, at JAXA. He was part of the Hayabusa 2 sample return mission from the asteroid Ryugyu that um, aims to clarify the origin and the evolution of the solar system. And his work at JAXA also involves contributing to large-scale planetary missions um, led by ESA, such as the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury and the Jupiter Icy Moons Explore Explorer mission. And he's one of the founders of JAXA's Martian Moons Exploration Space Probe. And I'm thrilled to invite him to share about the project and why this mission is considered significant in Japan's preparation for human exploration beyond our moon to the Martian system. Dr. Fujimoto, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be here um, speaking together with the artist, which is kind of e intimidating as well. But let me try my best. So I wouldn't go too geeky. Um, instead of explaining about the details of the space mission, I'd rather explain why JAXA wants to go to Phobos, wants to do the sample return back from Phobos, one of the Martian moons, now. So the key was uh, actually the, our ambitions to be a member of the Mars Exploration Club. So first, why sample return? Uh, it's because we have made a big success with Hayabusa 2. Hayabusa 2 is an asteroid sample return mission. We've been to one of the primordial asteroids, Ryugu. And the reason we selected this uh, primordial asteroid is because of uh, the fact that our planet, Earth, was born dry at the very beginning. So Earth was in, born in the inner part of the solar system, but which means that Earth was born dry. So in order to make our planet habitable at all, you need to bring some materials like water or volatiles from the icy part of the solar system, which is the outer part of the solar system. So the connection between the inner part of the solar system and outer part of the solar system is, was necessary to make our planet habitable. And uh, Ryugu, the, uh, the primordial asteroid, it was born in the outer part of the solar system, coming towards in the part of the solar system and uh, hitting Earth, proto-Earth, bringing water and volatiles to make a hab planet habitable. That's what we think. So uh, I think it's a, it's a nice um, question to ask. So that's why we went all the way to Rigu to get some samples back to Earth for a detailed analysis by the instrument on, on the ground. So this is how we get the samples. We, uh, the sampler horn touches the surface of the asteroid but without, without any other part of the spacecraft hit by the rocks on the surface. So, uh, it, which means that we had expected some flat area to be present on the surface of Ryugu, but when we arrived at the, that, the asteroid Ryugu, what we found is this very unfriendly condition of the surface. It's rocky everywhere, and um, which as opposed to the expectation we have had. We need a if we had a big flat area, the sampling operation would have been much easier. But the fact is that the surface condition is very unfriendly. But that's something we learned only after the arrival to the target asteroid. Because this asteroid is only one kilometer-ish. It's tiny. It's just a dot in the sky from the ground observations. We knew that it's a primordial asteroid, but nothing more. So after arrival, we find this very un unfriendly condition. So we had to. Uh, we had to develop a new technique to, uh, to, uh, make the, to make the sampling uh, successful. But we managed to do so, and this is the scene from the first uh, touch and go sampling. Now the spacecraft is at 12 meters above the surface, making sure that it is in the right position. And after it, it has confirmed that it, it is in the right position, it started to make a free, throw, free, flow, uh, free fall onto the surface of asteroid. And now, 
the tip of the sampler horn is touching the surface. And everything went um, perfect uh, according to the plan. So we thought we couldn't confirm. We had no way of confirming it, but we thought that we did get good, good amount of samples. But then um, after this first touch and go sampling operation, we performed this impact experiment shooting the bullet into the surface of the asteroid to learn about the crater formation process under the microgravity. But at the same time, um, this impact experiment enabled us to excavate the surface materials, more fresh materials that, that, was, that was under the surface, to be um, sedimented onto the surface of the, of the asteroid, which is ready to be, to be, um, to be sampled. So there was a big discussion about this, but uh, we managed to persuade our, our um, stubborn, you know, <laughs> people in, in above my, my pay grade, and uh, we managed to perform this second um, touch and go sampling very successfully. Now, and with this um, bold and ambitious operation, we managed to get the fresh subsurface materials in our hand, which we need to bring back to Earth. And uh, the way we bring, bring the samples back to Earth is to bring the spacecraft close to, the, to Earth and let it pitch the sample return capsule back to uh, Earth. And, and actually, the landing spot was an, a desert in Australia, Umera, to where I have been to by myself. And December 6th was the like, defining day for, for our space agency. And this uh, um, capsule recovery operation was happening under the pandemic, by the way, so which was really not easy, but we, uh, we are there waiting for the capsule to come down. And this is the fireball created by this, the capsule that's, um, that's diving into the atmosphere of Earth. And then uh, the capsule made a safe landing to the, to the surface like this. So what you are seeing is the, the white part is a parachute and then the small uh, grayish thing is the sample return capsule which we picked up quickly so that we don't get the terrestrial contamination. And then within the special facility back in Japan, uh, we opened it up to find that this uh, mission was a very successful. It's a big catch, um, 50, 50 times more than the minimum requirement. But at the same time, it's not just the quantity, but uh, it was in quant quant uh, not qu uh, qu quantity, but quality. Quality-wise, it's a very precious sample to learn about early days of the solar system, processes in the early days of the solar system that made our planet, uh, you know, uh, life-bearing planet. So it was a big success. So it must lead to an, another nice mission. And we think Phobos sample return mission is it. So now the question is, why Phobos? Um, just to let you, uh, let, let you, just to, uh, let you um, remember, um, Phobos is one of the two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos, and Phobos is the one that looks like an asteroid. So Phobos is an, like, an asteroid-looking small body orbiting around Mars. And that's enough for us to think that it should be our next target, because as I said at the beginning, we are interested in the connection between the outer part of the solar system and the inner part of the solar system. And if you look at this uh, image, you can clearly tell is that Mars is sitting at the gateway position between the inner part of the solar system and the outer part of the solar system. An asteroid-looking weird body circling around Mars, which is located in this key, 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 key part of the solar system. That's enough for us to tell that it should be focused we should go to Phobos uh, to learn to, to, to um, you know to learn more about the connection between uh, the outer part of the solar system and inner part of the solar system beyond what we are what we are learning from Hafsa too. And at the same time, if we make this mission successful, it will be the humanity's first return trip to the Martian system. We're talking about, about human mission to Mars. But when you're talking about human mission to Mars, you need to go there and you need to come back. I don't think you're, you're, you guys are talking about suicide missions. Um, so then 
when that day comes, when the day of human Mars exploration comes, you, you come to think, you, you should remember who did the first return mission to the Martian system. It's going to be us. So we think this Phobos return, uh, Phobos sample return mission is a big step for us to be the to be the, uh, a member of the Mars Exploration Club, we have not been able to, uh, uh, to, to do so yet. And uh, in addition to that, um, included in the Phobos, included in the samples we will acquire from the surface of Phobos, there will be some Mars materials included. So this is like a poor man's Mars sample return mission. I know, you know, NASA and ESA is working very hard to make the Mars sample return, very sophisticated Mars sample return um, become true. But on, on the other hand, we are doing this, you know, poor man's uh, Mars sample return mission, but still, it should be exciting. And then, uh, as I said, this is gonna be our first step into Mars exploration. But then what about, what about beyond? And uh, we are already starting to think about Mars landing mission, landing on Mars itself. So then the question is, why now? It's now, it has to be now because of this Artemis. Um, Artemis, it's, it's um, kind of a movement led by NASA that everybody together should uh, explore Moon and then Mars including Singapore, by the way. Singapore is, is, a, is a member state of Artemis Accord. So, um, yeah, you guys should think about participating, not just staying as a spectator, but participating in this movement, um, you know, exploring moon, moon and then Mars. But then in this, in this time of new, new era of space exploration, we will have a, we will succeed in Mars la uh, moon landing early next year. And this is a small uh, lander on the moon, but it has a lot of new technology embedded in, in the program. And in addition to this, we have been developing a key technology for lightweight access to the surface of Mars. So what I mean by this is that we are interested in lightweight access to the surface of Mars um, because, you know, well, ESA and NASA, they, they do big and impressive things, but it's not easy for everybody to be a part of that big missions. On the other hand, uh, with this new era of space exploration emerging, everybody should try to think, of, think about becoming a player, not just watching what's happening, but you should try to become a player. And then, um, well, it's ESA, NASA, and others. And JAXA is, is among others. But um, we have done something with some small, small and nice missions. So maybe even in, if, if it's even in Mars, Mars landing exploration, we should think about uh, international collaboration friendly, small and nice missions so that we can go, to, we can go and, and explore Mars together. So it's Mars landing exploration for all, that's something I want to create in the next 10 years, including uh, participation from Singapore. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be hearing more from Dr. Fujimoto in the panel Q&A later. Um, our next speaker, Michael Najjar, is a German artist, adventurer, and future astronaut based in Berlin. His works examine the technological developments that are defining and drastically changing the 21st century. And Michael combines science, art, and technology to create visions and utopias of future social orders emerging under the influence of new technologies. His works in the exhibition, Starbase and Starship, unfold the interplanetary future of mankind that's taking shape by visualizing the development of a spaceport in Texas, where SpaceX is planning the first manned mission to Mars. And in his video work, Terraforming, he combines footage of Iceland with Martian landscapes to enter into a dialogue um, with the most existential question of our time, um, saving Earth's future. So please warmly welcome Michael for his presentation.
Thank you very much, uh, Sin, for the kind introduction. And first of all, I have to say, the micro? Yeah. Okay. Now, everybody can hear me? Sin, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And first of all, I have to say that I'm extremely proud to be part of this amazing exhibition. And big congratulation, really, to everybody who was involved in this project and making this exhibition um, become reality. So let me introduce you a little bit into my um, outer space series, which I'm working on since now 2011. That means for the past 12 years, I'm working on the topic of space exploration. Um, by the way, I have a 12 year old boy, so uh, his entire life he's confronted with the topic of space exploration now. And um, this series focus on the latest developments in space exploration and the way they will shape our future life on Earth, in Earth near orbit, and on other planets. So how did I start it with this series? Everything began in 2011 when I saw and photographed the very last launch of an American space shuttle. So that was the Atlantis shuttle. And I flew down to Cape Canaveral and I saw this launch, I photographed this launch, I created an artwork which you see here, it's entitled Final Mission. And I was absolutely blown away by this experience. And when I saw the shuttle rising, immediately I had the impulse to say, oh wow, one day I want to be in such a shuttle and I want to fly into space. So I started to work to do research on the topic. It was a very specific moment in history, in space exploration history, because with the end of the space shuttle program, the Americans had no more technology to bring humans into space, to the International Space Station. And that was the moment when a lot of private players came into the field, like space SpaceX, um, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic. So it was clear that a technological leap gonna happen. And during my research, when I came up with Virgin Galactic, I contacted them and I asked them to become one of their future astronauts. And at the end of the day, that worked out. I'm one of their astronauts. I will fly into space in the near future. And once I had the ticket with Virgin Galactic, I said, okay, I need to do um, some more um, extreme experience because as, as an artist I'm very much depending on my own personal experiences to create um, artwork. So I decided I have to do space training. I approached the Russian space agency and asked them for the permission to train with the Russian cosmonauts in Star City. That's the training center near Moscow. And after one year of discussions and trying really um, to, um, um, yeah, to make them open the doors, it really happened and they allowed me um, to go there for training with the professional cosmonauts and astronauts. And that was at the same time an, art, an um, artistic performance because I was taking pictures there. There were other photographers um, taking pictures of me during the training. And I had to fulfill, of course, the goals of the training. So I give you some examples of what I did. Here you see the zero G training in the Russian illusion. I tried to learn how to take pictures in zero G, and I can tell you it was totally chaotic. So it's really not easy. I did a spacewalk training underwater. So they put me in an astronaut suit and then there's a huge gigantic pool where is a mock-up of the International Space Station and there I train um, to work and to move in simulated microgravity environment. So here you see me in the astronaut suit and behind me is the mock-up of the, of the International Space Station. So once I learned how to be in a spacesuit and move in a simulated zero G, um, they put me in the MiG jet fighter and I flew up into the stratosphere up to 20,000 meters altitude with twice the speed uh, of sound. And there I learned how to cope with extreme gravitational forces. So I had to cope up to 8G in that jet fighter, what was really one of the toughest experiences in my life, I have to say. Then I did uh, several centrifuge trainings in Russia, in the US, but also in Germany. 
Um, this is where they spin you around and you also have to uh, cope with extreme g-forces and see how your body reacts to these g-forces. If you are not able to cope with these forces, it's not recommended that you go into a rocket. So I also um, made an extreme experience, a so-called halo jump. So I jumped out of 10,000 meters altitude. And um, that was for me, the driving force to do that, I wanted to feel the force of gravity. So um, to, to, do, um, to produce a video artwork on the topic of gravity. What, so what better can you do is just falling down. And I had two minutes of just free falling towards the surface of the Earth. We had several cameramen in the air and they shot footage during my fall and later I created a video artwork based on this footage and based on this experience. So later then I began to create more artworks based on all these personal experiences. I will show you some selected pieces from the series. The body of work in the meanwhile is really huge. I have more than 70 artworks now in this series. As I only have 20 minutes, I did a few uh, selection uh, for you. So let's start with an um, installation view. Here you see how the artworks are installed in a, in a, a museum exhibition. The size, normally I work with very large scale images. Here the pieces are 180 by 3 meters. And um, that gives you a little bit Id an idea how the work is presented. If you want to see them in real, you go down and see the Mars exhibition. So this work became one of the iconic work in the series. It's called Liquid Gravity. And it explains also a little bit the work, the way how I work as an artist. So I'm always interested in the um, construction of reality. I'm not interested in showing reality, but in the construction of reality. So the artworks always oscillate on a thin line between simulation and reality. So here you see um, the astronaut floating in a zero-g uh, or microgravity environment. That's me during my training. The picture was shot in 12 meters depth underwater. And as you can see, there's a planet Earth in the background. That is inserted digitally. And that change, changes totally the perspective of the artwork. Because if you look now at the picture, you question if this is real or if this is a simulation. And if you look as, as a viewer, if you look to Earth, that means your own point of view is catapult, catapulted into space. You have to be in space yourself to look at this situation. And that explains a little bit the way how I use the medium of photography and how I do the artistic uh, uh, creation. So then I get a, got a bit obsessed with the rocket launches, I have to say, um, because it's really a mind-blowing experience to see these rocket launches into space. I spend a lot of time in French Guiana. Um, this is in South America on the equator. And there is the European spaceport. And this is such a surreal place because once a month, a huge rocket, the Ariana rocket, is launching from the forest, yeah, from the jungle, and then flying, blasting off into space. So this is really um, um, a very, very heterotopian and surrealistic place on the planet. Here we see an installation view um, of the piece at the Museum for Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul. This is um, an artwork which I did also in French Guiana, but it's a Russian rocket. This is the Soyuz rocket that the Russians already developed in the 50s. And since today, this rocket um, is flying into space and bringing cosmonauts to the International Space Station. Then I had the incredible opportunity to photograph one of the golden mirrors of the James Webb Space Telescope. You might have heard that this telescope st uh, was launched um, to space um, a year ago, and um, it's now bringing us incredible images and incredible data from the universe. We learn a lot about how the universe was formed and created. This um, instrument was built over 10 years. It consists of 18 golden mirrors, and I had the chance um, to photograph one of these golden mirrors. Here you see me photographing. That was in, in the clean room of one of the NASA uh, laboratories, and I have to say I was never as clean as 
in this situation. It took about three hours to prepare me for entering um, the, the clean room, and um, I was allowed to go about one meter fifty close to the mirror, um, not closer, to take pictures. Here you see an installation view, the ZKM Museum in Germany. Talking about astronomy, there's one really exciting massive new instrument that's in China, that's the FAST. This is the largest telescope on the planet. It's a radio telescope. And um, you won't believe it, but this has a diameter of 500 meters. So it's really massive. And the Chinese built this um, gigantic telescope in the middle of nowhere, in the mountains. and. Um, I was able to climb up one of the peaks of these mountains to take uh, this picture. And what I uh, liked so much about this uh, instrument, the ch uh, Chinese uh, government built this instrument to detect foreign extraterrestrial signals. So that's the main purpose of this instrument. Yet let's see if they will be successful one day. So here you see an installation view at the Auckland Art Gallery in uh, New Zealand what we certainly know, honor. And uh, that was an um, um, amazing exhibition and installation there. Talking about astronomy, um, here you see one of the most spectacular and important buildings in astronomy. This is a building in the Atacama Desert in Chile. This is the home to the, for, um, um, the most, um, or for the most important scientists in, in astronomy. They are allowed to work there and to study um, the cosmos and the universe and to use the most powerful um, telescopes there. The problem they have now is when they look into the cosmos, into the universe, they see a lot of stripes, lines, scratches in the night sky. And these are satellites. These are reflections of satellites. This is the new Starlink system that SpaceX is putting um, into, into space. And um, the goal here with that um, network is to put between 40 and 60,000 Yes, 40 to 60,000 satellites around the globe. So this will be a massive network which will provide internet access to the entire globe. But with this new technology, SpaceX also inscribes technology into the night sky. And that raises absolutely the question, who is allowed to take the night sky as a canvas and write things on it? Yeah, so it's uh, technology inscribes itself now into the night sky and that raises a lot of uh, questions when it comes to the placement of satellite constellations. So now let's go a little bit far, uh, uh, further away in, the, in our solar system. This here is Europa. Europa is one of Jupiter's moon. And years ago, NASA scientists detected that U uh, Europa hosts a 100 kilometer deep ocean. That's 10 times deeper than our ocean on Earth. And this is the most likely um, location in the universe that we know so far, which could host extraterrestrial life. And I was very inspired by this uh, story and I created an artwork which is a composition of images that a satellite took from the surface of the moon Europa in combination with images of glaciers and ice mountains that I took in Iceland. Probably the most important achievement that humanity made in the last century was the moon landing. Yeah, so that's the first time that people landed on another celestial body. And I created a triptych and artwork to celebrate the 12 astronauts which, has set, which have set foot on the moon. And what I was so interested in is that, in that um, these astronauts, and that we should not forget, they did amazing experiments, scientific experiments. That was their goal, not just to hold the flag 
um, and so we are here. They did very, very important experiments on the moon. So this artwork that I have created is based on original footage from all the Apollo missions. So these are about 4,000 negatives. I went through all these negatives. I selected um, hundreds of them, and then I re did a recomposition of the lunar surface, so the surface you see here is a fictive landscape, but it's based on real footage from the moon. And then you see all the 12 astronauts working and conducting scientific experiments on the lunar surface. So now we make a move from the moon towards Mars, which is um, our topic, of course, uh, today. This artwork here, entitled Sands of Mars, shows a Martian landscape with, which is on Earth. It's also in the Atacama Desert, and this is actually a landscape where scientists are testing rovers before they send them up to Mars. So Curiosity was driving there, other rovers, because it's so Mars-like, and when I was there, scientists brought me exactly to the location where the rovers were driving before. I shot this landscape, and I put there a little habitat, which are geodetic cupolas. This will be probably one of the first structures that we will see on the surface of Mars. Maybe not everybody of you know that Mars, which we consider a dry and red and empty planet, once had an atmosphere. There were oceans on Mars. So scientists discovered, um, with, with the water discovery on Mars, they could find out that millions of years ago there was a huge ocean on Mars and with 100 meters high waves. And the waves moved in slow motion due to the lower gravity. And um, I found this a very intriguing and interesting idea that Mars was once Earth-like. So I took a picture that Curiosity um, shot on the surface of Mars, and I just changed the color. So I gave this a blue color, and from a distance, what the image here looks like, like a huge wave. And that's also the title of the artwork, it's Waves of Mars. But in fact, it's, this is a sand dune. Yeah, so it's a sand dune on Mars that Curiosity photographed. But if you see the piece in real with a little bit of distance, it looks like a huge wave. And as we are now discussing a lot of topic, the idea of terraforming, that means bringing Mars maybe back to an Earth-like uh, condition. So this artwork is entitled Mars Cubes. And um, four years ago, NASA sent for the first time uh, CubeSats out of our Earth orbit to Mars. CubeSats are very small. They're just like this. And Mars, uh, NASA sent two CubeSats to Mars um, to, um, to go together with a landing mission, but also to find out if we maybe can place a kind of a constellation of CubeSats between Mars and Earth. On the upper um, part of the artwork, you see the Earth. On the lower part, you see Mars. And the goal is to establish a new communication network between Mars and Earth. As the signal takes about 20 minutes, what is really long, going from uh, Mars to Earth, and back and forth, it's 40 minutes. So we have to find new technology, how to speed up the, uh, the, the communication process between Mars and Earth. And that's what this artwork is referring to. Well, we were discussing before when the first man or first human beings will set foot on Mars. Before we do that, robots will set foot on Mars. So this is a, a NASA-designed um, robot which um, is intended to be sent to Mars to begin settlements, to begin preparations before humans land on Mars. So this artwork is entitled Starbot, and it's a very intelligent, um, independent um, robot, which I photographed at the robotic center of Edinburgh. Here you see um, in, in the laboratory, um, it's, it's my size, so it's man uh, size, and uh, it's really an incredible uh, machine, and uh, one day we will send these to Mars 
to begin the preparations for the arrival of humans on Mars. We have seen this work uh, already uh, before in the presentation. It's the work that is hanging here. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me which is also hanging here in the exhibition. This triptych is entitled Starbase, and it shows the most future, futuristic place probably <clears throat> on the planet at the moment. This is in Texas, and it's <clears throat> in a little village called Boca, Vill um, Boca Chica. And there, SpaceX and Elon Musk are building a massive new spaceport. It's not only a spaceport, it's a, it's a space city they are going to build. And this is, when, when you go there for the first time, when I went there for the first time and I saw this, I could not believe that this is real. It's like a movie set. It's like a pure science fiction movie set, but it is real. And the, the spaceships that you see here um, on the image is so big that 100 astronauts will fit in this starship, in this spaceship. You can put the entire Eiffel Tower in one of these ships. And they're not building one or two or three. They're building dozens of these ships. And this is such an important place on the planet because this is the cradle for humanity where we will launch and head off and start into our solar system. This is the launch place for us towards Mars, and that's probably going to happen in the next decade. The interesting approach of SpaceX and this um, place, their uh, star base, is that <clears throat> normally you would build a launch pad, and when everything is ready, you bring your rocket to the launch pad and you try a launch. So SpaceX is do the other way around. They produce a rocket and a, star a spaceship, they put it in the middle of nowhere, and then they start building a launch pad around. Um, so that's really crazy. So when you see how uh, much construction work it, it's going on there, and in the middle is standing a spaceship waiting for <laughs> Uh, for uh, the, the launch pad gets ready and for its test flights. So it's really absurd, uh, this situation. And there's, there are more absurd stories on that place because Boca Chica was a small village of about 20 houses five, six years ago. Then SpaceX came and bought the territory and said, we're going to build a spaceport here. But not everybody agreed to sell its house. So some of them just stayed. They didn't sell their houses. And um, you won't believe it, but people are living there. So they're living in the middle of a spaceport. And they have huge rockets and starships in their backyard standing. Um, so that's really very um, surreal when, when you see that. So I'm coming to three final artworks, um, which I have produced uh, this spring. In April this year, there was the very first um, test flight of the integrated launch system. That means the Starship, which you see here on the upper part of this huge rocket, and the lower part is the super heavy booster. This is the Starship launch system. This is 120 meters high. This is a 44-story um, building. So it's unbelievable, the height. and. They built a launch tower, which is not only launching the rocket, but also capturing the rocket when it comes back from space. And it will be fully reusable. The, tool, the whole system will be fully reusable within one day. So I photographed the launch pad a day before the launch. And this artwork is entitled Starship Tranquility, because it was a very calm day on the launch pad. Everything was prepared. There was massive tension everywhere, but it was very quiet. And then this happened, the launch. And that was the most powerful and massive launch humanity ever did. The rocket launched with 60 million kilonewton thrust. That was twice the power of the Saturn V rocket, which brought us to the moon. It was such a massive launch that half of the <laughs> launch pad got destroyed. So they built, they made a huge crater in the launch pad and stones were flying around. And I had installed several cameras near the launch pad with remote controlled access. So of course you cannot be that close to a launch. So we need remote controlled systems to do that. And the artwork is a digital composition of several stages 
of the launch, and uh, but basically it shows what happened when the huge ship um, rose up into space and massively big rocks were flying around. And these rocks were also damaging the engines of the um, of the Starship, and that was the reason why Starship, during its flight towards space, came out of control. And when I was standing there looking up to the sky, suddenly a painting appeared on the sky. Starship did a painting because it, it, it got out of control. It went to the left, it went to the right, and suddenly it went upside down. So it was crazy. It was totally uh, erratic um, because they lost control of the vehicle. But the beautiness was that a, a wonderful painting of, of, of clouds suddenly um, was drawn on the sky. And here you see, I photographed several faces of the launch after one minute, after two minutes, after three minutes, and then these are composed together to create this artwork. And after four minutes, they, um, the automatic destruction system um, applied and the rocket was destroyed. You see that on the, in the upper left um, part of the artwork. And that raises also the question, this artwork, what is failure and what is success? And when we want to go to Mars, there will be a lot of failures because this is totally new technology, new science, new technologies. We have never done this before. So of course, there are a lot of failures. There will be a lot of explosions until we come to the day when a ship really launches on Earth and lands on Mars. And we should not consider this as failures. We should consider this as progress, step by step, until the day when really humanity will reach the red planet. And I will end my presentation with a quote of Jules Verne. If a person flies to other celestial bodies and realizes how beautiful it is on our Earth, space travel has fulfilled one of its most important purposes. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Michael. Vincent Christ is an Indonesian artist, um, space science activist, and director of the Indonesia Space Society, ISSS, which started as a framework for different um, for space exploration from a different perspective um, by working with artists, scientists, astronomers, engineers in Indonesia, but also institutions worldwide. And through its projects, ISS has uncovered space as a continuous source of inspiration that compels us to better understand the universe around us and our place in it. And the Society's VMARS project aims to conduct research that could support human life on Mars in the future and is a pioneering effort in space exploration for Indonesia. The exhibition showcases documentation of VMARS progress over the last two decades, and we're so pleased to have Vensa um, share a little bit more about his work at ISSS with us. Vensa, please. ある日突然火星で暮らせと言われたらあなたはどうしますか私がいるのは火星ではなくてアメリカユタ州の広大な砂漠ここで火星への移住を想定した特別な実験に参加しています NASA や今ではベンチャー企業までも目指す火星 
現実のものになろうとしているのです There is the future. If we do what we can do, there will be new branches of human civilization. 火星で暮らすためには何が必要なのかそれを探るため砂漠に作られたのが着陸船をモデルにした MDRS Hello everybody My name is Vensa from Indonesia and this is the first uh, project that uh, we collaborate with uh, Japan especially and uh, sponsored by many company at that time in 2018 in uh, Utah is called MDRS uh, Mars Desert Research Station and uh, it's called Team Asia so that is uh, seven uh, Asian and two robots living together during one month in M MDRS and also uh, we do a lot of research uh, during that time and the idea is to uh, bring a lot of uh, new technology in different perspective of why we want to explore a Mars planet or why we really want to go to Mars. So actually uh, this is the first idea that we are really want to do uh, in the many places on earth because not many country have desert or maybe not many country uh, have the similar atmosphere or similar uh, situation uh, like in America or uh, in other places. So we're trying to have uh, the first project in, in Utah uh, with many institutions and also this is support uh, also by the uh, Mass Foundation from the Elon Musk and also uh, organized by Mars Society and supporting by uh, many private company, of course. And this is the part of the, the documentary movie uh, sponsored by the NHK International Japan and uh, it's already uh, done in 2019. And uh, it's like uh, National Geographic things, but this is uh, NHK International version. And this is, uh, we, we, we edit the, uh, uh, that movie for the short presentation. So that is uh, some images that uh, we can imagine that uh, is a lot of stuff going on uh, in that period. So the second, the second mission, uh, how if we imagine that we are on the way to Mars planet, so in Utah, is we imagine that we already landing on Mars. So the second uh, collaboration with the field assistant, uh, ISSS, that in 2019 uh, make the like, project inside the Sirase. Sirase is an icebreaker uh, ship, uh, usually from Tokyo to Antarctic uh, every year. And then uh, this is some, some, some images that uh, we do also one month uh, insight uh, in the parameter of why uh, we really want to go to Mars planet. So uh, after the pandemic, uh, we cancel uh, the project because the third step of the project, uh, actually, we really want to go to uh, Antarctic, Antarctica, and then uh, we are canceled because of, of the pandemic. And then uh, that, in that moment, is bring me to have the idea why I'm not make by ourselves in Indonesia. So the, uh, as we know that Indonesia didn't have the desert, everywhere is green. And yeah, the, the question is, we will have the Mars analog in the tropical country. That is. Uh, quite challenge. So uh, we're trying to have the idea in the complexity of a uh, lot of collaboration because we know that uh, in Indonesia have a huge lack of the uh, educational system. Usually uh, we don't have 
much astronomy faculty, for example, uh, from uh, 4,500 university uh, and also uh, campus is only have one uh, astronomy faculty from uh, 279 uh, million population in seven, more than 17,000 island in Indonesia. So that is, I think, is most the most important thing that for uh, independent uh, uh, community like us to bring uh, this kind of of the of the idea. Sementara itu pemirsa, tiga pemuda Yogyakarta membangun pusat pelatihan hidup di Mars yang diklaim akan menjadi yang pertama di Asia Tenggara. Ini menjadi bukti peran aktif Indonesia dalam eksplorasi Mars. Ingin tahu perjalanan mereka dan berikut liputan selengkapnya untuk Anda pemirsa. Bermodal pengalaman pribadi menjadi orang Indonesia pertama. That is, uh... The promotion that uh, we did in Indonesia, especially uh, collaborate with the government, uh, private sector, practitioners, and especially also in uh, some uh, experts in the university. And uh, we're trying to have the connection with many uh, national TV stations uh, to have like an impact of the why we really want to do the Uh, promote uh, the idea of the Mars planet in, in our country. So the one, one of the one of the example that uh, every year we have to do uh, some practical and hands-on uh, workshop for especially people on the village because um, in 2000, 2023 data, is more than uh, 43, 44 uh, percent from the population still living on the village. And uh, we, we, we're trying to have the compos good composition, uh, collect and calling all the participants from independent community in different background from the uh, science, uh, also is non-science, uh, especially in the contemporary art, uh, to Uh, collect the ideas and the working together with the zero money and 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 what they, they can do for for the for the uh, this kind of the issues so the we create Indonesia UFO festival every year so the name of the the name of the uh, UFO is not real real UFO that we we believe about the UFO but Uh, in Indonesia culture, especially that we uh, have a lot of uh, uh, mysticism, uh, uh, atmosphere, and a situation that when you talk about the pop culture, when you talk about the something that are real, uh, usually hearing uh, or appear on our ear, that uh, probably they will come and they will join. So that is some images from uh, every year that we compose. Uh, all the participants, all the uh, connections, especially between a uh, lot of uh, independent community in, in Indonesia. So, uh, for you guys here, if you, if you want to uh, join or participate, uh, it is free to join and you can do anything you, you want and you can do uh, anything kind of uh, project, uh, especially in the village, in public spaces and Uh, is in non-commercial uh, activities, and please uh, tell me or tell to uh, our community uh, to have uh, activities uh, every year. And uh, one of the activities uh, is called SETI, uh, is International SETI Conference that uh, invite a lot of uh, from elementary school, uh, junior high school. Uh, until the uh, people from the university, of course. And then uh, we're trying to get a lot of the idea uh, why uh, uh, the, the uh, space science, astronomy, and also space exploration are important uh, to have the, the place that uh, really uh, that, uh, engage with uh, uh, our culture uh, at the moment. So, 
uh, we invite a lot of uh, participants and speakers all over the world. And uh, usually we, we did in, uh, in every, every July, uh, uh, every year. And it is example of, <laughs> uh, it's called Kampung Alien. Kampung is the village. So why alien? Because um, as I mentioned before, when you're trying to have some unique things or some craziest thing uh, inside uh, or in the middle of nowhere, uh, the children or, or, or people on the village especially really want to come to take pictures, selfie, and, and, and when we, we're trying to do a lot of workshop, especially, for example, uh, you can see we just bring a lot of telescope. Uh, refractor, refractor, Newton, Galileo. Uh, that is the, the the six meter statue of the alien that we built uh, inside the villages, and and, and they came uh, like this is the astronomical night that we trying to uh, teach how to use the telescope. That's just very simple things. Uh, of course, we we have the we have the project uh, in advanced technology, but. Uh, we uh, we realize that a lot of people still uh, never uh, see or never trying uh, to do the simple thing as a as a as a telescope like in the in the image. So that is uh, that is only one example. Uh, related with uh, the exhibition of of the Mars, uh, this time uh, we also have the collection of the, the artifacts that we collect, uh, I think more than 20 years that we hunting in many islands in Indonesia, that the idea is how to build the first, um, the history of science fiction in Indonesia. So all the artifacts that connect, or the artifacts that uh, ever been in Indonesia, uh, this is the, the small places, our studio, that uh, we display in the very, very simple things, and then you can see a lot of, uh, a lot of things uh, from toys, uh, books, novel, uh, gambar umbul, or, or even uh, many uh, tapes, VHS, laser disc, VCD, that lot of things uh, that until today we still collect, and in the future, we're trying to do, uh, to build the, proper uh, science fiction museum in Indonesia. So that is the idea of why we still collect uh, anything related with the uh, astronomy, space science, or space exploration. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. A key factor to sustaining human life on Mars is the ability to grow and produce food on the red planet. And the exhibition currently hosts an experiment comparing the growth of plants um, in regular soil against Mars stimulant soil as a way of understanding how life on Mars could work, um, but also the implications for life on Earth as our environment, uh, as our environment changes. This plant experiment is an initiative by space faculty and is jointly prepared by scientists at the Genome Institute of Singapore at ASTAR and the Singh Health um, Duke NUS Institute of Biodiversity Medicine. And Dr. Roy Ang, who is scientist at the Laboratory of Biodiversity Genomics and lead scientist of the Space Seeds Project, will speak about stepping stone research that our scientists here in Singapore are undertaking to advance understanding of what it takes to grow crops in Mars. Um, please welcome Dr. Dr. Ang. Um, before I begin, I just want to say a huge thank you to the Art Science Museum for inviting me to speak uh, today, and um, also to shout out to Space Faculty for connecting us with this amazing opportunity to do something incredible in this museum. And um, today I hope to share a scientist's perspective on uh, how our scientific endeavors are building uh, a future for humanity in space. 
Um, so here's a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll give a, a quick run through of what we do in the lab for in terms of research and how we got involved in this uh, the whole space thing. Um, and then I'll launch into a discussion on why there, we have a case for life on Mars and where, why we should be setting up our first extraterrestrial colony there. And, and I'll end off by sharing a bit about how science we do today form the stepping stones towards living on Mars. So, our research. Uh, in our lab, we study plant genomes with a focus on food and human health. Uh, for those of you who, are, who do not know, a genome is essentially the genetic information that is encoded in any single organism. Uh, you think of these as the DNA sequences that make up genes and other elements that encode for biological function. And so we use next generation sequences to uh, sequence and assemble whole genomes of plants in Southeast Asia. You see all of them on the screen right now. These are 50 plant species that we are assembling genomes for at the moment. And we are intending to study the molecular basis for their uses either in food and or traditional remedies. All of this work is done in collaboration with the SingHealth Duke NUS Institute of Biodiversity Medicine, uh, BDMED for short. This, is founded in two, this institute is founded in two, September 2021 by Professor Tay Bin Tin, Senior Group Leader at GIS and Deputy CEO of Research at National Cancer Center Singapore. Uh, BDMED aims to drive and accelerate biodiversity research and that promotes all aspects of human health and wellness. Their research program focuses on three domains of interest. The first is herbal, herbal biodiversity and medicine, second, hum food biodiversity and nutrition, and third, urban biodiversity and wellness. Uh, in our lab, we believe that the, the, the all biological discoveries starts with building high quality genomes and that they facilitate novel biological discovery. So what we do is we adopt sequencing technologies and computational methods that have been developed for humans uh, to assemble uh, chromosome level genomes for plant species of significance to us in, here in Singapore as well as in Southeast Asia. Uh, these, are, these are two examples of genomes that have been published by our lab. Um, we have the durian genome that was done in 2017 and the Singapore national flower, Papilo uh, Ms. Joachim. Um, that was published in 2022. Um, and to give an example, for durian, we found genes associated with the production of volatile sulfur compounds. These are the ones that give durian its strong characteristic odor. And then for the national flower, we found an interesting class of enzymes that were involved in the production of a small a, a class of molecules called vendaterocytes. These are compounds with the potential to slow skin aging. So I come to the part where it's exciting. How do we get involved with space? It turns out that um, uh, in last year, early last year, we participated in a pilot study sending coriander seeds to space. And this was done through the Asian Herb in, Asian Herb in Space program that was organized by JAXA. Our work was published, uh, publicized on the Straits Times in December 2022, uh, as you can see on the screen there. Um, our lab was in, in charge of analyzing the plants that were grown from the space exposed seeds that came back from the ISS and comparing them to plants that were grown uh, uh, in seeds that have never been exposed to space. And the sample size was small, but we found differences in the vegetative mass of plants that were grown out of space exposed seeds. And we identified changes in the expression of hundreds of genes. And we, um, this brought about um, many more questions as to what kind of biology, biology is, uh, is going on uh, for these uh, seeds that have gone to space. I mean, this was interesting, but it leaves two big questions. First, are these differences heritable? Because if it's something that just sends, it shows up once and then disappears after that, you know, that's not very interesting. And second, can the mutants that come back from space be harnessed for new plant applications? Can it be used for indoor farming? Can it be used for growing plants outside Earth? Right? These are questions that we uh, really wanted to answer, but uh, the pilot study uh, kind of stopped short there. And so what we did was we submitted a proposal to the Office for Space Technology and Industry. This is a, sub, a small office within EDB. And we were awarded a $2 million grant to repeat this experiment at a much larger scale. So think a larger collection of seeds across more species of plants. And the goal is to try to leverage cosmic mutagenesis to screen crops for beneficial indoor, far, indoor farming traits. So the plan 
is to send seeds to the ISS for about one to four months and then collect the seeds, uh, return the seeds to Earth and grow them inside indoor vertical hydroponics uh, setups, as you can see on the screen over here, this purple room here. And um, the goal is to screen these mutants for, for traits that are useful for indoor farms, uh, such as faster growth, uh, shorter height, so you can stack more of them inside a, a box, and, all, and also the ability to grow in low light, because there, we, these indoor farms don't have any natural light at all. And the goal for this project is to build a seed collection of useful mutants that can be bred to produce superior cultivars that enable sustainable food production uh, in indoor farms in Singapore. Okay, so I'm done with the research part, and now we get to the fun stuff. Here, I would like to share with you why I, why, why I think the, there is a case for life on Mars and why we should build an extraterrestrial colony there. It is no secret that humanity has always been fascinated about space and extraterrestrial colonies. Uh, Rachel did a fantastic uh, rundown on the science fiction in films uh, genre, and I'm just putting these uh, films up here as a reminder you know, that of, of stuff that have left a deep impression, uh, at least to be. Um, and I, I think, it, and this just not only extends to film, but also think of things before film, like books, games, and, and at least a personal interest of mine is video games. Uh, I'm very invested in the uh, Warhammer 40,000 universe, for those of you who are aware in the crowd, um, where Mars in that universe was depicted as an uh, industrial world, where a lot of the machines are being produced. The whole planet is taken over to produce machines in this futuristic universe. So I think there's, there's this huge fascination and a long history of, of, of pursuing uh, space exploration and, and, and co extraterrestrial colonization. And of course, like when we think about Mars, the, this movie always comes to mind, The Martian. In this movie, Matt Damon plays as Dr. Mark Watney, a botanist and mechanical engineer that was stranded on Mars after an emergency evacuation by his team. And uh, while waiting for the rescue mission, which was years away, uh, Dr. Watney repurposes his surface habitat, which is the, what the image you see here, um, to to grow potatoes in Martian soil. So he converted rocket fuel to water and used crude bio waste to fertilize the Martian soil in order to grow these potatoes. Um, and then this kind of captured the imagination of uh, the, the, the audience worldwide as to like, whether are we going to go to Mars and actually grow plants? Uh, it's similar to what Matt Damon is doing in this, uh, in, in this film. So here comes the case for colonizing Mars. I think there are four me reasons in my mind why uh, Mars should be the, the first extraterrestrial colony to build. First, it's very near to Earth. Um, the close approach, which is when the two planets come close enough for us to send a rocket to, occurs once every 26 months. So we can do regular missions uh, to Mars, well, regular in the sense of once every 26 months, which is a little more than two years. And the journey time from Earth to Mars is seven months. Seven months is a uh, it, short enough time frame for us to send humans, right, uh, to, to, to reach Mars and to set up life there. Um, in addition to that, Mars, uh, the, the length of time for the day as well as the year on Mars is somewhat similar to Earth. Uh, we have a, on Mars, there's a slightly longer than 24-hour day, which means that when we grow plants, for example, they are, they are, which are accustomed to a 24-hour light cycle on Earth, they, would do, they should be doing okay on, on Mars as well. And, um, the <clears throat> and then Martian gravity is about 40% uh, of Earth's, so it's not completely zero gravity, and it's a little bit lighter than that of Earth, but it's adaptable, I think. Um, and the last, but I guess the, even the most compelling reason is that Mars is mineral rich. So it, Mars can be easily converted into a mining world, and more importantly, it can be a staging ground for further exploration into the solar system, the asteroid belt. The, the, the space is the limit here. But of course, the road there is not straightforward. There are a lot of Martian challenges to life, and uh, of which some, I list some of them on the screen here. Mars is a very thin atmosphere. If you step out into, uh, into Mars without a suit, your, the water will boil off your skin. Uh, this is not a fun experience for, for any of us here. It's also full of carbon dioxide, which you, none of us can breathe. And um, there is no water, uh, no liquid water at least, uh, though there's polar ice that's present on the planet. So when we think about living on Mars, we would think about you know, living in something like a, like a biosphere, kind of depicted in this image on the top. Uh, in the top right. This comes from a video game called Surviving Mars, um, I, which was published by Paradox Interactive, which kind of gives us a glimpse of like what life on Mars could be like. There's a lot of automation, 
a lot of all the human life and lives in these biospheres that are, are contained uh, from the, the harsh Martian environment. But in reality, I like, think when we eventually get there, it will likely be, we will likely be living in these um, uh, modular-like uh, systems that, uh, that you see in the lower right corner. Okay, and now how are we getting there? How is science going to get us or put a man on Mars for in, the, in the next decade or so? Um, we have a long history of sending unmanned missions to Mars, so I think at least two decades, right? And I'm picturing some of these uh, uh, unmanned rovers and satellites that have already been uh, to Mars and have given us a lot of information about what Mars is like, the Martian soil, the Martian atmosphere, um, you name it, right? And it's built it's on the data that's collected from these uh, um, satellites that we get to do a lot of Earth-based scientific inquiry. For example, what is the composition of Martian soil? Can, Mars, uh, can life survive on, in Mars's thin atmosphere? Where can we find water on Mars? And I guess the one that's most relevant to us, can we grow plants on Mars? Right? And I'm showing on the screen uh, two just two examples of like, the, 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 what we have been doing on Earth with the data that was collected from Mars. So for example, we are able to build, the, the, there have been teams that built uh, a, what a Mars climate database based on the data. So this is a simulation of all the data points that was collected from the rovers that have been sent there um, to simulate what Martian climate is like. And then, uh, on, and the other example, this is not for Mars, but this is the picture of scientists growing plants in lunar soil. So as you know, we have been to the moon, we have sent, uh, we have put a man, multiple men on the moon, and we have collected lunar samples back uh, to Earth. And what, they, what you are seeing here is uh, uh, these scientists taking lunar regolith, these are, this is lunar, uh, basically moon soil, and growing little plants inside them. And what they found was interesting, and it turns out that the, um, that the plants, uh, when they're grown on actual moon soil, have very different growth properties compared to um, moon, um, lunar simulant. So lunar simulant is reconstructed from what, they, uh, what, uh, what we have on Earth, but the, the properties are completely different, right? So that, that, that begs the question, you know, when we eventually uh, get to Mars, and get Martian soil back, what would the experiment look like? And um, I guess when preparing for this uh, exhibition at, at, at the Art Science Museum, uh, the space faculty came to us and suggested, why don't we try growing plants uh, in Martian simulant? It turns out that, that, that people have done this before. There have been, there's there at least one paper we found that had people studying Martian simulant and growing plants inside. So we figured that, yeah, we, this is something that's worth doing uh, inside Art Science Museum to kind of capture the imagination of people um, to, uh, on, on the kind of research that we can undertake here in Singapore for, for, for this kind of uh, work. So what we did was we, well, you, you see this picture, this, bo this metal box thing that looks like a refrigerator, is actually a plant growth chamber. So we're able to control the growth environment in, uh, inside, uh, inside this, uh, this growth chamber. And we set up pots of earth soil and Martian soil simulant, and we put the, uh, these plants, at least two species of plants for now, uh, inside the, both conditions, just to see whether they grow or not. And then when you guys go to down to the exhibit uh, in, in the basement, you will see uh, the plants that we have grown uh, to date. So as the, as the plants mature, we will be bringing in new pots to, to refresh the, the exhibit. So there'll be something new every time you come back. And I just want to wrap up by saying that this is just one small sliver of what it's, the science that it's taken to eventually getting to us to live and work on Mars. And there are so many problems that we have to tackle in order to build a sustainable, like a, a sustain a, a extraterrestrial colony there. Think of the oxygen that we need to produce, uh, how we're going to get water, how we're going to grow food sustainably with the, the resources that are available on Mars. How are we going to generate power? Is it by solar power, or nuclear? Nuclear, nuclear power, how are we going to communicate with people on Earth, and the, what is the structure of the shelter that we are going to be uh, existing in? Is it going to be these metal boxes forever, or are we thinking something bigger, like a glass dome? Like We have to test all these things out, and the, the, the good news is that lots of these things can be developed, uh, are, are currently being developed uh, you know, here on Earth, and will eventually be, make it up there as part of the many, what part of the many progress missions, right, to quote uh, to Michael, uh, progress missions that will get us eventually to a successful colony on Mars. 
Um, and the, I just want to mention the food example because the, here you see a picture of uh, something like an, almost like something that looks like an indoor farm. And the incredible thing is that all the technology that we need to grow an indoor farm is being developed or has already been developed uh, here on Earth. So that, that begs the question of can a similar model, if, if we get indoor farming successful in, uh, here on Earth, can we adopt a similar model when we eventually set up our first extraterrestrial colony? So th that's all I have. Uh, if you're interested to connect with us, uh, we're always happy to, to look, uh, to, to collaborate and over science, space, and everything in between. Um, so uh, reach, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, that, it, that QR code leads to my LinkedIn. And, uh, for, and uh, Prof Tay is here in the, uh, in the audience as well, and he's, he'll be happy to chat more about uh, the work that we do in uh, GIS as well as at BDMED. And with that, thank you very much. Our concluding speaker for the symposium program today is Lynette Tan, CEO and chairwoman of Space Faculty, and she really is a pioneering figure in the space industry here in Singapore. Lynette co-founded Singapore Space and Technology Limited, SSTL, um, back in 2007, at a time when the space industry was literally unheard of here. And in 2021, she founded Space Faculty, a platform that aims to inspire the next generation by providing space-related educational resources and programs to anyone interested in space, from youth to professionals already in the industry. So it's my pleasure welcoming Lynette to talk about why space is the new frontier for big ideas and the potential mass um, holds for humanity. Um, Lynette, Lynette, please. Um, thank you so much for the introduction of, and friends who uh, join us. It's better than being in a lab, right, on Saturday. <laughs> so space, uh, we always say it's the final frontier. Uh, but, you know, really it is, from what we are seeing, the first frontier for innovation, um, invention, and imagination. So I'm really happy to be doing this here and to a different crowd. Um, I was really inspired by what I've seen so far. It's uh, not a space we live in. And uh, I think Michael, who's an artist, you know, has lived so much more of space when I see his work and his art than I have in my last 17 years. So very interesting for me to see things, my job from a different perspective. So a little bit about space faculty, we are about expanding the space economy for a better world. Uh, the space economy, the space industry holds tremendous potential in technologies and knowledge. And as you can see here, it is a tremendous source for inspiration and imagination. So we want to expand the economy. It's a pun here because, you know, in the Big Bang, we always talk about expanding universe. Uh, so we want to unlock that potential the space industry holds. And obviously, um, well, it's not obvious, but with the intention of creating a better world with what it contains and what it has. Uh, our DNA is in experimentation, learning, and leadership. Uh, on the left, you see a range of programs that we have for uh, partners. We are uh, for our partners, and uh, we work with industry and government primarily, but of course we work very closely with educators to give them insights and knowledge and tools to be able to influence the next generation of future of leaders. Uh, so these are the people I'm very comfortable working with. They're very the MNCs, non-government organizations, uh, technology companies. Um, so coming to this collaboration with Art Science Museum is really making us step out of our comfort zone. And we're very happy we're doing this and to be sharing our knowledge and our passion for our work with, through your platform to such a great and big audience. Thank you. Um, so, we, okay, <laughs> I, I have a little bit of a corporate slide, but just to put things in perspective as well, uh, the global space economy is valued at USD $550 billion. It has been growing this before COVID, during COVID, after COVID, at 8 to 9% every year. 78% of this industry is in the commercial, private sector which means that when we see astronauts and rock uh, deep space exploration, they actually contribute a small part of the space ecosystem. So space is truly becoming ubiquitous, and today's work on seeing the art side of space uh, really shows and tells us that it's the mainstreaming of space is going to continue and going to accelerate even more. 
And to put things in context, the AI, you know, comparing like to like the AI and cybersecurity sectors, they are worth about uh, 200 billion US dollars, you know, comparing from the same year. I'll share with you some interesting developments in the space industry on Earth. So we always say, oh, this is rocket science. But actually, rocket science is no longer rocket science. We have so many players now who are able to uh, understand thermodynamics and aerodynamics and many scientific principles to build rockets in a more efficient way. Uh, and uh, I think this has really created that ability for more people to access space. With the commercialization, the innovation has been coming into the sector by in encouraging more private sectors, where there are many smart, intelligent people. We're seeing so many fundamental changes in technology and in shifting economics in space. Space travel is a reality. So we have Kelly and Sarah. They were the first. Uh, they were one of the first female private astronauts. They flew out with Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. And uh, two weeks ago in Dubai Air Show, I was really privileged to be hosting a fireside chat with these two amazing women. Uh, you know, they're so passionate about the work they do, doing science experiments, and more importantly, so humble and uh, down to earth and recognizing that very important voice they have to bring more women, uh, more minority groups into the space sector. Coming back to Singapore, some work that we do uh, is in showcasing how space technology can be used in our everyday life for good. So one of our primary uh, partners, the Singapore Land Authorities, has tremendous research capabilities in using satellite navigation systems to uh, show differences in height and in, in distance. Um, on Singapore, and this kind of technology is used in tracking land subsistence and seawater level rising, including in the construction sector. They've been uh, keen to unlock that potential, and we run programs with them to get uh, young students in uh, pre-tertiary and tertiary to understand how space technologies can be used for good. So in some of the ideas that they've had uh, was in using the navigation capabilities enabled by space technology, satellite technologies, to help guide elderly people uh, to find their way around the HDB estate and some of the mature estate. Uh, and, of course, and then, of course, in last mile delivery, which is a very difficult uh, process you know, in Singapore with a lot of urban environment, uh, urban obstructions for, to do. So these are ideas and concepts. Uh, it will still be a long way to prototyping and making them viable. But it's very exciting to know that we have these capabilities in Singapore and we're attracting young people to think about using space for good. And what I like to say is celestial technologies for terrestrial applications and good. Uh, I want to have talk also about two new areas, or two areas about uh, space that we should look at, which is in enabling new R&D development and life sciences. Much of it was uh, also spoken by Dr. Roy Ang from the Genome Institute of Singapore, one of our very, uh, you know, partner we're very happy to work with. Uh, besides their capability and deep expertise, you're very passionate and energetic about the work that we do. So we're very similar, very like-minded in so many ways. Uh, I also want to talk about space technology for sustainability, which is an big topic. Uh, we're not checking out the boxes, but if you really think about it, uh, how have we know, how did we know that there was a hole on the ozone layer? How do we know that there was greenhouse emission from this and uh, who was doing good? It's all enabled by space technologies. And uh, I'm shivering a bit also because, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> very, uh, I'm in an audience I'm not familiar with, but also because it's very cold, so pardon the quivering. Um, but space technology also is, and there are Development and innovation that's coming into the sector is growing uh, with the commercialization of the sector. And that means that with the technology development, we can identify more emissions more accurately and do even finer uh, you know, analysis of the findings that we have to find out what actually is the state of health of our planet Earth and where can we go to tackle it. Uh, of course, Singaporeans here in the audience might understand it's also very important to have data points in order to find or rather go, account, go after people for accountability, which is really, really important in enforcing uh, the actions towards uh, 
you know, ensuring we have a sustainable world to live in. Uh, space technologies do do that. So besides the ability in life sciences to find out how we could grow things with less fuel, less energy, uh, it's also the tool for us to monitor and find solutions uh, for uh, in our climate action. Uh, there's some other things I want to share with you about uh, quite quickly. Uh, we all understand biomimicry, the in inspiration we get from Mother Nature, uh, which provides us with solutions for how to live uh, on Earth more sustainably and efficiently. Uh, you know, biomimicry is essentially the form or function of nature, understanding its natural processes and mimicking it, and uh, replicating and mimicking natural systems. Uh, we use that in te sustainable technologies today, for example, in the Fibonacci spirals that allow us to harness space uh, solar powers in a more efficient way. And uh, you'll be familiar with solar, uh, solar heliotropes. So with the solar panels, they were inspired to look at how the sunflower turns towards the sun. And this allows solar panels today with uh, these capabilities to take 14 to 73% more energy. What I want to bring you really to is so a biomimicry. You can Google and you find so many things. What I really want to bring you to, which I had, I struggled Googling because, it, you know, it popped off my head on a long S M MRT ride from east to west uh, one day, uh, was in celestial mimicry, and that's why I enjoy the work that we do. Uh, perhaps there are answers in the stars, and I'm not being poetic here, but solutions that we can find when we look into the stars to see how we could manage our environment. Uh, more efficiently. A lot of these problems we have now on Earth is relating to energy, right? We want to send things into space, we need energy. We put food, uh, wear clothes, they require energy. And we take this energy from Earth. We mine them, we dig up the soil, we extract the lithium, we take the coal, we take the oil and gas. And that's starting, the starting point for causing uh, the stress that we are experiencing now living on Earth. And I wonder if we look up into the stars, can we find solutions? Like how when we look around our nature, we find solutions to live more efficiently. So I came up with this. Uh, so good luck if you want to plagiarize. Uh, the form and, so perhaps celestial mimicry is the form and function of space bodies. Could we mimic it? Could we replicate space phenomena? Could we understand how space systems work to find better ways to use energy, create energy here on Earth. We already have one big starting point, the star, fusion technology. Uh, instead of fusion technology, which causes uh, harmful uh, side effects because that is man-made, the stars have a way of working itself out of creating energy that drives Earth and that gives us life here on Earth, but in a very clean way, in a very uh, stable way. And now you know, uh, just two days or th a couple of days ago, US have also announced its plans for nuclear fusion technology and it will do so at COP28. Uh, and we are now seeing a lot of investment that has gone into replicating stars here on Earth in becoming solutions for what we're experiencing here as an existential threat. So that's the only celestial mimicry example I can find, but I want to challenge all of us here to think about more. We are so creative, so much creative energy in this space here. What else can we do? Perhaps in plasma technology. It is the fourth state of metal, the most abundant state of metal in the entire universe. Maybe that's a way for us to hold energy and to utilize it besides digging things from Earth and heart hurting ourselves. Because ultimately, in space, there's always an interaction between energy, force, mass, and time. So just like how we found, uh, you know, Vanda, I couldn't pronounce that multisyllabic name, but that uh, protein from uh, Vanda Miss Jo Kim flower in reversing aging, maybe there's something we can find in space-time to reverse, you know, aging in a different way. But I really think we could learn so much about space here and uh, to be able to find solutions that we could use so much more intelligently. And when we become multiplanetary, you know, harnessing the capabilities of the stars is really not off limits. Um, I did this because my team said, Lynette, you really should have a quote. Okay, great. So I'm going to end with this. I really think space is a tremendous cradle, a place for innovation, inspiration, and definitely imagination. And I'm really excited to see what we can do 
when we're imaginative and we're inspired and we're innovative. <laughs> Take this for Brendan. <laughs> Uh, thank you, this is all I have, uh, and thank you again, Art Science Museum, for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. We were very nervous, we were like, oh my gosh, they're arts people, right? We're like, no, they're art science, and this is really the place to be where art meets science, where past meets present, and when earth meets space. Thank you. Um, so we're going to get Lynette to take a seat um, on stage for the panel Q&A. And I'm also going to invite Vensa, Dr. Roy Ang, Dr. Fujimoto, um, and Michael um, to join us um, for questions from the floor. Um, so this second panel of the symposium very much dialogues with the final section of Mars, the Red Mirror. And um, it's called Mars in the Anthropocene, which turns its attention to the climate emergency and considers the critical dilemmas of humanity's present and future. And I'm going to ask the big question that probably is lingering in all of our minds, um, which is the balance of resources that's invested in space missions and the search for planet B um, versus addressing the social political issues um, here on Earth and pres preserving our one and only home um, to search our, uh, and whether we should be doing that instead. So I'm going to open this question to all the speakers and getting you to chime in with your viewpoints on this, please. Um, Roy, you look, you look ready, so maybe I could go to you first. Um, I, I defer to Lynette first, because I, I know Lynette has a very scripted, uh, has a scripted answer for this, so I'll let her Good start. Team. <laughs> so I have to start being a bit embarrassed, because when I saw Planet B, I was just being very scientific. It's just a naming nomenclature, right? Planet A, Planet B, <laughs> Planet C. Um, and I went on to say it, it's nice to have a Planet B because it's nice to have another planet to go to and uh, travel to and, and find new things and find new ways to do different things. But I did uh, say in one of our earlier conversations, it should definitely not be a Plan B. You know, it's ridiculously difficult to piss in, on Mars and in space. And I think we don't want to spend one hour in the bathroom trying to unlock this flight suit and get our business done. So I, I don't think Plan B or Mars is an option for us to escape from Earth if we screw up here. Uh, so don't do that. But we should not stop exploring the unknown because that has what humanity and mankind we have been doing since we were created on Earth. Thanks. And Dr. Fujimoto, can we come to you next? Yeah, it's you. It's realis realistically about therefore, um, you realize how difficult it is, and then that, I think that's already telling you how precious our, our planet is. But um, yeah, jumping onto that, that you know, that final thing, um, I think just working on space science missions together will bring people together and stop fighting. So, uh, yeah, um, these days uh, we do a lot of international collaboration in space science missions, but, and then in, in that context, people think that international collaboration is a way of making a mission to happen. But um, maybe not. Um, yeah, space science is, is something everybody is interested in, and then uh, international collaboration may be a part of the goal of space science missions, bringing people together, do something nice together instead of do something wrong against each other. Um, Benzo, what about you? Uh, uh, in my perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's more only uh, about we are ready or not ready for, for, for anything that we, we will do. So uh, related with the space uh, science or space exploration, or maybe specifically for uh, how to explore uh, Mars planet, I think we are far from for 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 ready uh, uh, situation right now. Uh, in in my in my perspective, so um, how how we we can uh, really ready uh, for all risks because it's uh, really have super super high risk uh, when 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 um, 
people on Earth uh, go to uh, Mars planet with the all natural disaster there or, or radiation and uh, no, nothing there and all the logistics that we have to bring from the planet Earth and how the, the, high, the high cost of, of, of a lot of money that we have to spend on, on the research. But the process of the research means that a lot of the uh, humanity because um, I think the process itself, the, the, the educational, um, the education uh, process uh, in between uh, from the idea coming up until when we are really go to Mars planet, uh, I think that is the most important for the uh, uh, human on Earth because that is, that is the most um, uh, valuable and, and uh, realistic that we can learn a lot from the experiences. Uh, of course, uh, collaboration with uh, many, many countries, many institutions, many scientists, and also many crazy guys on Earth. Uh, in the future, yeah. I'm gonna come to you next, Michael. I think the, the wish for discovery is innate in our genetics. Now, and sometimes we have to look, or we have to change a little bit our time scale if we look at all these things. If we ask when will we set foot on Mars in 10 years, in 20 years, but what about if we catapult us 500 years in the future and we look back? Yeah. On, when we look back 500 years, um, when I just read a biography of Fernando Magellan, sort of the, the first guy who found the passage through South America and crossed the Pacific Ocean. So the first ship, the first crew who passed the Pacific Ocean. Uh, that today, this is just uh, um, um, crazy to think about that, that there one ship discovered the passage through the Pacific Ocean. And of course, that was 500 years ago. And in 500 years, we will have inhabited the entire solar system. So that's a total normal uh, process of um, evolution. And I think uh, sometimes we really should think in, in, in different scales and, and larger perspectives. And if we talk about all the problems that we have now to, to today on, on, on the planet with the climate uh, crisis, sustainability and use of new energy sources and resources and how we use resources, this is what we learn when we venture into the solar system and to other planets. On Mars, there are so limited resources. We cannot bring much stuff to Mars. We have to in invent and discover and learn how to live with the resources that we have there and use them in a very sustainable way. And that will help us also a lot to treat um, and better, hopefully, uh, our own planet. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to add on what Michael said, which is that um, my view on Mars is that there's going to be less humans and more robots. There's going to be a lot of you, uh, a lot of AI, a lot of autonomous uh, entities that will be operating on, on the planet. And, and, that w and this will happen way before the first human sets foot. And, the, and likely will continue even after humans leave uh, the planet. So I think that in the long run, I see Mars as kind of like a staging point for further exploration into the solar system because it has a lower gravity. It could be potentially easier to launch uh, vehicles off the, the, the planet as well. So I think that that's my perspective on Mars. Um, thank you for chiming in with all your perspectives. Do we have questions from the floor that we can offer to the speakers? Um, Mr. Goh. I apologize in advance. That's my daughter. <laughs> um, hi, I Maybe think she has a question. <laughs> um, hi, I think the uh, first panel asked me to convey this question to the second panel. Um, like, let's say, which year, the specific year, you think we will land on Mars, just, you know, a guess. And the thing is that, like, if you can comfortably, like, colonize the moon and the Mars, then what's next? Would it be, like, asteroids? Or would it be, like, a free uh, space reigning, like, colony, you know? Um, or would it be, you know, Jupiter? You know, one of the uh, moons or something like that? Thanks. <laughs> so when, when's when we will we have the first step on the Mars? That's yeah, the question. Uh, yeah, um, I was attending a meeting um, 
in, in DC, Washington, D.C., in the U.S., and then uh, there, wa there was this question, and there were three heads of NASA divisions working together to make, uh, to make this um, Artemis program um, happen. And um, officially, it's 2040, but to my surprise, all of them, all three of them said 20, early 2040 is not realistic, because if that is the case, we have to be we have to be sending cargo already to the surface of Mars. And, uh, and I, I find that to be um, how do I, not, uh, not discouraging. I find that to be encouraging. Because, th wow, these guys are thinking seriously. It's not that they didn't give a, uh, how do I, what's the word? They didn't just give a, uh, what's the word? It's like a, just for the, t to entertain the audience. They said, oh, yes, we will make it in 2040. I think they are really serious about this. And um, it's not just sending somebody there, you know, just, it, it's happening on the moon already. You know, you ha we have to send lots of cargo so that, uh, you know, the life will be susta life sustainable system on, on the surface of, of those um, ter terrestrial bodies. So, um, yeah, m m within the next 50 years, and I think that's quick. That's not slow. I think that, that, that's quick enough. In the next 50 years will be my answer. Yeah, um, well, I think if one term really goes along with space exploration, then it's the, the word delay. Um, so most of the missions are delayed, and it takes longer than we think and than we hope. But the, the really the next target will be the moon. Um, as Masaki said, we're going to return with the Artemis mission to the moon. And this time we're going to stay at the moon. Compared to the, to the 60s now, the, the goal is really um, installing a base on the moon. Um, stay there for scientific research, but also for commercial purposes, because um, Moon hosts a very, very precious um, uh, resource, and that's helium-3. And there we go back to um, fusion uh, energy. Helium-3 can be used uh, in fusion reactors to uh, create enormous amount of clean energy. And that's why many countries are really very keen on going back to the Moon and then uh, bring helium-3 with a robot um, down from the moon to, to Earth. So the moon will come massively into focus, I think, in the second part of this decade. And from what we learn then from the next moon landings, uh, moon will be a springboard to Mars. So what happens in the next five years until the end of that decade on the moon, I think will give us um, a good indication for the coming decade and um, the schedule, what will be possible our way to, to Mars then. So if I were to venture a guess, oh, I'm sorry, Roger, thank you. If I were to venture a guess, I would imagine a movie where they would make in the year 2050 and they would show a young <coughs> child, man or woman, a young girl or young boy who would be looking into Mars, and the movie would be about her growing up, him or her growing up, and finding ways and solutions to create settlement and food on Mars. So this is how it does work, right? We have a lot of mission to Mars, you know, exhibitions uh, and platforms like these to inspire young children. And they will grow up going to university, studying physics and science and math, and being very hardworking young, child, young children, young students and then going on to work on the mission that they believe in. So I think it's going to be the year 2050, another 25 years for them to grow up, graduate, get a PhD, postdoc, do some like internship in cool labs. Um, and I think it would be, so 2050 would be the year I would say, go buy a 4D number if you're Singaporean, <laughs> it's the weekend. Um, and <laughs> on that part about why moon, not Mars, why Mars, not moon, it doesn't end. It's unfortunately the insatiable desire in humanity to discover what will, will never be satisfied. It's not that it's Mars or Moon. It's just the Moon was closest. We go there. After that, Mars. And after that, Titan, Europa, Jupiter. I'm sure we'll keep going on. So even if we miss being in the Mars Express, maybe we'll be on the Jupiter Express. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I get a qu quick question to Roy, please? Um, how optimistic are you about 
the potato growing that we're seeing in the Martian and, and with all the research that's being done in soil science, um, do you think it will mean um, someday it could be possible to grow food on other planets as well? I'll just preface by saying I'm actually not a plant biologist. I study genomes, not plants. But but from what I understand from the um, from looking at literature on Martian soil, it turns out that there is uh, there's this compound called plachorids, uh, which are actually toxic to plants. There there is not a lot, but there's some of it inside the the Martian soil. And so the question is like is the is the level high enough that it inhibits uh, plant growth? We don't really know. The simulan that we're using now does not have perchlorates, so it will. So we do not know whether that effect will, will will hamper plant growth. But that is an open question, and I think when I think about the the uh, return missions from Mars that brings Martian soil samples back, that'll be something that I'll be interested to test. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, please. We'll go to you. Hello. Um, I, a lot of missions which were described today or in ex during the exhibition is very national missions. What do you think we can do more to encourage more international collaboration for Mars exploration? Um, would you like to direct your question to perhaps uh, one or two speakers? Oh, all right, so anyone who would like to respond to this. So how to encourage more cooperation? Well, that, that's, that really hits what I wanted to say in my in my in short presentations, because, um, well, I know you guys are really interested in human exploration, human, human to Mars, but uh, don't jump onto that, you know, final step. It does, you know, there are processes leading to that final step, and I think that's something you said. Process is the most, in, most interesting part, in a sense. So, you know, you have the goal, we have the, we share the goal together, and then uh, do something, participate, be the player, and in order to make that happen, um, what I'm thinking in my mind is that don't, don't just think about big missions. Uh, there are s nice small things we can do together. And um, if, if we, if I, I, I was just say, if I set up a nice platform that um, you know emerging space countries can join and share the goal of exploration, I think that's really the good way of um, you know bringing humanity together. Maybe I can get a question to Lynette. Um, the environmental awareness of today's youth is very lucid and pertinent, and they are very alert and sensitive to environment issues, and you're such a big advocate of um, working towards a planet where future generations can live at least as well as us, hopefully. Um, and there's quite a lot of outreach work that space faculty has been involved in, um, working with children and youths, um, getting projects like space camps, and also the space challenge out to them. So what are some of your observations from your engagement with this generation when it comes to um, space exploration, but also maybe sustainability and environmental science concerns? Uh, I'll start with a, a small story about our organization. Uh, during COVID, right, in places like Singapore, there was a massive resignation, right? The big resignation, people needed, you know, cooped up, and they wanted to do something that was worth their time if they were going to be working at home. So we actually didn't have the great resignation. We had the great application, right? And we benefited from people writing in to say, you know, I don't know how much you can pay me, but I just want to work with you and with your organization and do the work that you do. And this came from all ages. Uh, so with the younger people, I think they're also influencing the older generation in being more purpose-driven uh, in the work and th that we have, which is, which is really great. We talk about how we're older, we, we teach them things, but they have so much more power in changing the future because they're more passionate about it. And I like it that from what I see of, of leadership, of leaders, they're very open to being influenced by the, next, the young generation and the young people. So missions like sustainability, planetary exploration, it, it just hits the nail on the head for them. It, it makes them study that extra hours for their math or <laughs> physics test, I hope. But it's, it's really nice to know that uh, they're willing to work hard for the greater purpose. And of course, we have to give credit to the previous generation that work hard to put food on the table, to give us the good life that we have and I think we owe it to the previous generation to leave it to the best of our ability 
and to touch the stars, to find the impossible, to find solutions to you know, make sure we can live comfortably on Earth. And it's on the next generation, and they're building upon what we have from the previous generation. Thank you. Um, right, I've got a question from Anna, please. Hi, so this is a, a question for Vince and Michael. Um, I'm really interested to hear from both of you as practicing artists, what you feel that you as artists bring to the space science community. And what is it, what's, what's special about your perspective as an artist and the uh, kind of scientific work that you're doing? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, it's a difficult question. Um, I think it's related with uh, the, the question before. Uh, maybe not answer uh, your question, but I will add the, uh, that in the, in the near future, that will be a lot of surprising, will be a lot of crazy people on planet Earth that have the idea, uh, the, the gigantic imagination that will be changed our uh, imagination before. So that uh, because the technology is really, really rapid and uh, really, really fast uh, to, to develop. And then uh, the idea of the how to influence Mars planet, how to go to the uh, asteroid Hayabusa, how to go to the Phobos, how to go to uh, maybe in the next uh, Europa uh, of a uh, moon of the Jupiter and, and, and so on. The plan is have to be changed. The, the plan is in my perspective, the plan is uh, maybe always changing because uh, the, the human civilization is, is always have the many points in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the timeline of the civilization that uh, uh, they produce a lot of surprising. So uh, uh, as an artist, uh, to, to answer the, the question, uh, I feel that uh, the imagination uh, is not only that we, we can imagine about something and then we make the realization, but uh, the, imagine, the imagination itself is the, uh, have the evolution. So uh, the evolution of the unknown, the evolution of the imagination, and the evolution of the evolution, that <laughs> is probably that uh, the, 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 the important point uh, uh, that now uh, the human uh, on earth is looking for because uh, yeah I don't know my uh, in, in my perspective that um, imagination is, is, is not uh, is not the, is not have the same meaning uh, of the imagination that we knew before mm -hmm. yeah because because the imagination itself is the for me imagination is real and uh, imagination is is is, uh, is 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 really scientific, and we in the in the near future, I think uh, the imagination is really uh, something that uh, we can precisely can speak uh, about. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> I'm working pretty much at the intersection between art and science. I try to be kind of a translator what scientists and engineers are doing and bring that to a different audience, to a broader orient, uh, audience and transport that in a broader cultural um, discourse. And um, I work very closely with, with, with scientists because I, I need to understand their work. So before I start creating an art artwork, I need to learn about the process or the, um, the specific um, science which is behind cert uh, um, certain researches. So that's why the dialogue with the scientists is for me so important to understand their work. And then based on that understanding, I try to value their work in a different way and to bring it on in another field. Because what I also learned over the years that scientists very often are super genius, but they are very narrow-minded in their, sometimes in their world view, because they're so absorbed in their research and in their 
um, scientific world. Sometimes they do not understand the broader importance of the work they do to others. They are very much focused to the science world. Yeah? But what they develop, what they do, what they discover has value and importance very often for the whole planet. Yeah. And um, that's what I learned when I talk to scientists, and that's why they normally they are very open to talk and discuss uh, with me and share their knowledge, and then I to try to bring their work um, in the museum exhibitions, in the presentations, on symposiums, in books, in articles, um, try to a, a, a broader audience and uh, encourage the mm, discourse between art and science. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? If not, I'll just end with one last question so that we can wrap up in time for the film screening. Um, I'd like to ask all our speakers to maybe share one idea or new technology um, that you've been um, experiencing or you've, you've heard about or you've been working on um, recently that's really exciting in the space of um, space science, technology, inf innovation or art. I have a question. Do, do, <laughs> do, we, do we need to define or make the difference between art and science? Mm. No. <laughs> so but there is, but there, there is a division. And I think we, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we, there is a division, and we have to close the gap. Um, the, the, the separation is not necessary. It has to interfere. Definitely. And uh, if you look back in, in times of, of, of um, in, in the 16th and 15th century, that, that, that was different. And science and artistic expression was, had the same value, and they're very much uh, interacting. But I think we, in the, in the past years, we can see in many artist practices that this is becoming more and more common, that there is a collaboration between scientists and artists. And there shouldn't be a gap. It should be a collaboration. Yeah. Okay, can I can add on to this? Um, the gap exists because scientists think that they are not supposed to talk about why they do this, what, what drives them to do this. We just tend to talk about the fact rather than your, your emotion or whatsoever. So in that, well, maybe we're too shy, but you know, the kind of the work you do is really the channel for communicate with people that, you know, the, the why, you know. What's driving us to do this? And um, but yeah, it's yeah. Very, very often, uh, when people see my, my, my artworks, they say, "Wow, this is so science fiction. This is so unreal." And then it's so important to tell them, "Yes, but it is real because there is a scientific and engineering background behind that artwork, and that's going to happen in that laboratory and that research institute and that spaceport. It is actually part of our reality." I always love to end symposiums on a note of provocation, and I think this is the best thing that we can do and, and just wrap up the panel like that. And I hope everyone is all right with this. Um, so we're ever so grateful for the constellation of artists, um, art scientists and collaborators who have come into the fold of Humanity Reimagined Symposium. Um, Judith Huan and the amazing team at CCCB, we could not have asked for more wonderful collaborators, but also Dr. Fujimoto and JAXA, um, Lynette and Space Faculty, Dr. Roy Ang and um, ASTAR, um, Michael as well. Um, so thank you so much for um, for. Thank, thank you so much to all of you for speaking in the program. We are presenting a special screening of Devil Girl from Mars. You might have heard that from Rachel earlier. It starts at 7.30, and you're very welcome to stay on um, if your evening is available. And um, we're so pleased to be joined by all of you um, at the opening event for Mars the Red Mirror um, to not only consider Mars in the human imagination, um, but also how our closest planetary neighbor um, continues to play a central role in how we think about ourselves um, and our role in the universe. So thank you so much for all of you for continuing to be part of the Art Science Museum story. Um, please enjoy the rest of your evening, your weekend, and we hope to see you back at Art Science Museum again.